about it. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 2. Somebody's excited. I like it. Acts chapter 2. We're going to be picking up in verse 42. Acts 2, verse 42. Um, I just want to welcome you. If you are new with us, welcome. We're glad you're here. Hopefully you feel like you're loved as you step in here. Um, we have new connection cards, as Stephanie mentioned, right in front in the seat backs in front of you. So take some time, fill those out. We'd love to hear about uh, who you are and follow up with you. Also, if you're new and you don't have a Bible, as I asked you to turn to Acts chapter 2, there are Bibles in the back and these high blacktop tables. Um, they are our gift to you. You can take those home as well. I also want to say hello to our online uh, live audience here. We have people that watch all around the world. I know we have family members that are tuning in as well for our child dedication. So welcome. We love you. And uh, let's get going. So if you have turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we are in our final week of our series called Rose to Circles. And it's this idea that as a church, we are to ask the question, are we only finding community on Sunday morning when we sit in rows listening to somebody teach or, or listening to somebody lead in worship? Or are we moving towards relationships? Are we moving towards community? So we talked about in the series the value of getting connected and serving and to be used using your gifts that God has given you because we are part of the body of Christ. And so if you don't serve, if you're not part of the body, the body is crippled. And so we are dependent on everyone in the body of Christ using their gifts to, to, to move us towards the kingdom of God and, and his glory. And we also talked about the value of being in a small group, being in community and being connected with a God, gospel-centered uh, group of believers and, and really doing that, as we heard in the testimony, doing that before trial hits in your life. So that there are people that can come alongside of you and, and help encourage you and give you strength. And so it's important to be known. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the early church and we're going to kind of finish this series by looking at what are the, the signs of the early church that we can kind of grasp onto. What are the things that the early church has done that, that made the early church healthy? And, and are we doing that as a church? Are we pattering our lives in a similar way? Or the question becomes what, what is really realistic for the church in, in today's culture compared to in the church of Acts chapter 2 when we saw that they had been added to their numbers daily. But before I get into the passage, we're almost there, I want to ask a question. And the whole, the whole point of this, really, this teaching is to kind of, is kind of measure this question based on the reality of how we actually live our lives. So, so here's the question. If 50,000 people would, would walk through this building next week on a Sunday morning, 50,000 people would walk in from our community and they would say, listen, we want to learn about Jesus. Can you teach us about Jesus? The question I have to you as a church is, are, are, are we ready? Because the truth is, is we couldn't do church the same way. We would literally have to say, okay, where are you from? Okay, you take 100 people and you go there and you, and you go there. And hey, every night of the week, somebody's got to open up their home. And hey, lunchtime and breakfast time, we got to meet with these people and we got to tell them about Jesus. Hey, people who have been walking with Jesus for their whole life, it's time to step up. The reality is, is most churches, however, if that would happen to them next week, would say, listen, you, you have to leave. Because we, we are dependent on a few to do this thing we call church. And so we would have to push them away and say, hey, listen, we can't accommodate that. Because most of us, our church is rose. And so the question is, is, is how would we respond? What, what about our lives and the pattern of our lives? Could we say, hey, you know what? We're ready. We'll have to do church often. And we have to have a lot of people step up. But we, we can do it. And so the question then becomes, what is the early church? How do they mark their patterns in their lives? And how can we take something from that? With that overall question in mind, let's, let's get into Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to fellowship, and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And an awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing all the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so as we look at this first passage, we can stop there. We're looking at this passage and we're saying, okay, the church is clearly marked by fellowship, meaning that the measurement of a healthy church as we gain from the early church is not how many people are in attendance. The question is, is how many of those people are in true fellowship with each other? 
And so the, the measure of the church, it's kind of why we base this series, calling it Rows of Circles, is that the measure of a healthy church is actually not how many people are sitting in rows, it's how many people have fellowship within their lives. This is why it's, it's so important to, to go from just thinking church is a building that you gather to making your lifestyle be church. And so the question then becomes, as we look in then, what, what are some of the things that we can kind of gravitate towards as we look at the early church, some, some principles that they do that, that we have to kind of challenge ourselves, are, are we doing? So the first one that we see here as a priority in the early church is this, the apostles' teaching. And so just remember that the apostles at that time, they, they had a lot to learn. Again, when they were living with Jesus, they made a lot of mistakes. They thought different things, not true things. And so as they come to know the Lord, they're teaching, but they don't have all their theology together. And so really all they're doing is they're coming together and they're talking about the gospel. They're reminding the church about the good news of Jesus Christ and how, as Christ followers, now our lives are no longer about gaining the world. It's about God and it's about his kingdom because the gospel shows us that Jesus came not for this world, but for the kingdom to come and to redeem us, to rescue us from this world. And so our jobs as believers is to no longer think about the things of this world, but to say, is what I'm doing, is the time I'm spending glorifying God and building his kingdom. And so the gospel reminds us of who we are and who God is. And because that reminds us of who we are and who God is, it also reminds us of how we are to live our lives, how we are to spend our time. So the disciples are talking about this. But again, later in, the, later in the passage, the church has struggles with Jews and Gentiles. And how do they do church together? And then remember in chapter 15, circumcision. So, so it's not like they had all this figured out. But the church didn't divide into all these denominations over theology. Why? Because they were of one mind. Because the reason they gathered was actually the same, which is to glorify God and to build his kingdom. So the gospel, every day of their lives, reminded them of who they were here. How many of you would say that when you spend time with God in the morning, it focuses your day? Amen? It, allow, it reminds you of the things that actually are, you're called to do. And it makes you think about the things you do in your life that are a waste of time. And it centers you on the strength you're fi you find in Jesus and the purpose you find in him. That when you go to your job after that devotion in the morning, you are going to that job not for the paycheck, but for the glory of God and for kingdom building. It centers your day. It makes you see the world properly. And so this is what they're doing in the early church, is they're creating this pattern of, of kingdom mindset. And so oftentimes what we find in the church is a lot of us are biblically illiterate, meaning we don't spend time with the Lord. And so our patterns of how we live our lives are not kingdom focused. Like, I, I did this with the students on Wednesday. If I, if I would have you take a piece of paper and draw a line down that piece of paper, and I would say, everything to the left are the things you did this week for yourself, and everything to the right are the things you did for the Lord and his kingdom, how, how, many, how many of you would say that the left would be a lot, a lot longer than the right? Yeah. And so the gospel is to center us to say, listen, what am I spending my time on who am I spending my time with? And is that for the Lord? The gospel reminds us that we are all eternal and that our value and our purpose is far greater than the 70, 80 years, 90 years that we live in this world. So the, the idea of, okay, centering myself on what matters makes us ask the question, how am I spending my time? Because all of us, I know a lot of us here, we're at capacity. But the question becomes, are the things we do, are, we're doing with our lives are they for the Lord? And, and if they're not, can we redeem those things? Or maybe we got to cut them out of our lives. So the second thing we see that the early church does is not only have this pattern of reminding themselves of who God is and who they are and why they're here, but they also have this thing called fellowship. We get this idea of fellowship. Now, before I get into fellowship, one of the things I love about this church is we, we keep ourselves from being distracted by the things of this world because we are people of the book. What does that mean? It means that the word of God is our truth. It's our anchor. And so we get together every week. We, we are often challenged and convicted by the truth. Like, like I want to premise the rest of my talk on this. I'm not, my desire here when I get into some of these things that are going to be personal to you, to, not to make you feel guilty. But they are meant to make you feel convicted. So often when somebody has this platform, they're too afraid to be like to tell you the truth. And I've given that over to the Lord. Because truth changes us. Amen? 
It changes us, and it's rare. So in this idea, as we are people of the book, meaning the Bible is going to say things, and, and I hope that you look at your wife and you look at your family and you're like, you know what, we're not doing that right now. And that it would challenge you to say, okay, we need to change the patterns of our lives because they're not for the kingdom. And so as we get into this, the thing that marks the early church is, is this idea of fellowship. Now, this is kind of a churchy word, so let me break this down. It's simply a group of people that are coming together for a purpose. They are united in the spirit of God. That's what the Bible says. That they are all in relationship and they are all of the same mind, not because they come from the same background, but because they have the same mission. So it's literally this. Hey, are you, are you for the Lord? Yeah. Are you for his glory? Yes. Are you for his kingdom? Hey, come on with me. It's, it's hey, that's, that's what my life is for. That's what, that's what I'm living for. And so they're united in the purpose of their lives, and that creates this idea of fellowship. Philippians 2.1 says, a common sharing of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 2.9 says, sharing together in ministry. And so here's when I'm going to start to convict, okay? I love you, but this is good. No, it is. By the way, I'm going to, I'm going to own this too. I'm owning this too. Because I am a sa- I'm a sinner in need of sa- Savior, right? Like I, I'm in this world with you. I drive the same streets. I, I have the same Netflix. <laughs> H- here's the truth. If your time you spend is the same as the unbeliever spends. Meaning, if you love the things that unbelievers love, if you do the things that unbelievers do, if you laugh at the things that unbelievers laugh at, guess what? You're probably an unbeliever. If your idea of fun and friendship is the same as what the unbeliever has. You're probably an unbeliever. Why? Because the Bible is very clear that when the God comes into your life, when the Spirit of God comes into your life, He transforms your desires. And I guarantee you that the desires of the Lord, the things in which God sees this world, is not the same as how the unbeliever sees the world. So your interests will change. The things you laugh at will change. Paul goes as far as saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, he says, we are actually unequally yoked with unbelievers. Meaning that when you are in an environment that's primarily with unbelievers, you are actually to feel a little uncomfortable, a little awkward. Like I'll just give you an example in my own life. There, there are friends that I have that I'm intentionally in relationship with because they don't know Jesus, and I do. And I want to love them, and I want to I serve them, and I want to bring hope to them, and I want to speak over their marriage. But listen, when I'm in their environment, I feel uncomfortable because they're complaining about their wives, they're complaining about their children, complaining about their bosses, talking about the sports team. And I'm like, I love my wife. You know, I, I love to read the word. Like, like it's, just, it's just not the same stuff. Hey, let me tell you about what I did last week. I, I sat down with a 16-year-old boy and talked about Jesus. And they're like, what the heck? Because we just, we just don't do the same things. So it's not that, that I don't want to be in relationship with them, but that's not my community. That's not, that's not my fellowship. That's not the, the, the fellowship that I need in my life. No, no, no. I, I need people who love Jesus, who, who want to do what Jesus wants in their lives and who thinks that way. Because I am no longer going to chase after the things of this world. I am to sacrificially love unbelievers, but I don't desire their lifestyle. Are you, are you hearing me? And so if you are at capacity, if you are busy, but the, <clears throat> the things that are making you busy are because you are trying to be the same way as the unbelievers, meaning in your life, like, let's be real, your fun is going to the bar and getting drunk in the weekend. That's your fun. Listen to me. I have had many conversations with people who came to the Lord who were thinking that that was the best thing in life only to now laugh that that was what they thought was all that, they, that was there. Like, they, they think, I can't believe I thought that was all that was there, because now I have this amazing friendship, this amazing community, and I'm not chasing after this nonsense. And so we as believers, are we spending the time the same way as the unbelieving world spends its time? Because fellowship is this idea of, listen, we are intentional. We are intentional with how we live our lives and what we do. To have fellowship, it says, is to pursue hospitality. It's to be in intentionality with everyone around you. And to say, okay, there are gospel-centered communities that I need to be a part of because I need people who love Jesus that keeps me focused. And then there are times where I'm going to go into the world, but I don't desire the same things as the world. I'm there to be a light for Jesus. 
And so I'll just give you an example of how this is made, made true in, in our church. There are high-capacity adults. Most of you are high-capacity. You have busy jobs. You have a busy life. There are people just like you that just a few months ago said, you know what, we're going to make time to disciple students. It's just happened a few months ago. There's all these amazing high-level people have come into our student ministry, and they've opened up their homes, and they've literally built and, and bought homes to say, you know what, we're going to fill this with community. And so they looked at their lives and said, we're going to make time for the things of God, for the kingdom work. And so they literally looked at everything in their lives and said, okay, is this for the kingdom? And just a little testimony, when I was growing up, when I came to the Lord and I went to college, I only knew the, the unbelieving community that was around me, meaning I only thought friendship and relationships existed in this shallow, superficial world. And some of you know exactly what I mean. That my friends, all we did was talk about sports and something shallow, and that, that was friendship. Or we talked about our high school days, and oh, that's, these are my friends. And so that's all I knew. So as I came to know the Lord, I'm like, okay, what's this community that you're talking about? Because I've never seen it. And there was a family in Lancaster that opened up their home. And they had bonfires, and they had movies, and they just invited young adults to come to their home. So I went there with my older brother, and I was blown away. I was like, what is this? There wasn't a drop of alcohol there, but it was fun. And there was friendship and laughter and people who cared about me. And I, I sat down with a guy who fought a war, and I was just like, this is amazing. And I'm talking to him, and then I go over here, and there's this godly marriage, and they love each other. And it's, I'm like, this is awesome. And then I began to have this hunger towards this type of community that, that reflects the early church. This community that builds me up and, and speaks life into me and isn't talking about nonsense, but saying, hey, how's your marriage? How can we bless you? How can we serve you? And then in my, in my life, I was like, okay, that's it. That's what I need. That's what my family needs. And so they gave me a picture of what the gospel in the community looks like. And so let me ask you a question here. If, if, if I would ask your children right now, or maybe when they're older, if I would ask them, hey, hey is, your, is your family, were they involved in church? Would your children say, yeah, my family went to church? Or would your family say, no, we were part of the church? What would they say? I can tell you with a decade of working with students, if they went to church, they probably are going to leave it. But if, if, if they were part of the church, that's different. What would they say? Yeah, we attended, or no, we were, we were part. Everyone in my family had community, had relationships, were using their gifts. Guys, that's what we're called to do. I know a lot of us maybe grew up in a church that wasn't like that, that didn't even have opportunities to, to be a part of it. But God says, listen, church is not something you watch. It's something you live. And so the question then becomes, are you somebody who is part of the church? You know, I, I say to students in our ministry, when they're in seniors, oftentimes they just want to kind of hang out. And I say, no, no, be a person that leaves a legacy. Like, be a family that when you leave this body of believers, this local body of believers, you're missed. Because now we have to find another tech guy, another worship guy, another greeter, and another person of children. Because your family was all in. And not only were you missed in the church, but you were missed out of the church. Because you lived for the Lord. You lived for his kingdom. So what are you doing right now? As a family, identify those things. How are we living our lives? What are the patterns of my life? What are the relationships around me? Some of us right now, we grew up in, in a secular world, and so all of our dear, close relationships are with unbelievers. And we're thinking, well, I think, I think this is good. I have relationships with unbelievers. And I'm, I'm going to challenge you that you cannot grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can't be discipled by unbelievers. You hear me? It's not It's not possible. So it doesn't mean you don't love them, but you need to be intentional in finding people that can stir your affections for the Lord and grow you, and that you can have conversations with. That's what fellowship is. And so on top of this idea of fellowship, here, here's how they did it. It says they, they broke bread together. And so this reality of, of breaking bread, yeah, it applies to communion, but it also applies to just the fact that they were eating together. Like how many of you felt like in your life discipleship happened around food? I, I certainly do. Like, 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 here's the truth. You know where I disciple and am discipled, you know, the most of the time? It's at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> it is. It's like over lunch or breakfast where you're discipled. You're spending time with people. Here's the amazing thing about the church is you can have somebody who's on unemployment, that has no job, sitting across the table with the CEO, CEO of the company, and they are like-minded because they're brothers in Christ. 
And they're united with the same purpose. That relationship doesn't exist outside the church. But in the church, that's what makes us unique. It's because we're all together in this mission. We're all together in this purpose. And so they broke bread together. They ate meals together. So, so let me just kind of throw this out there. When's the last time you had a family from the church over to your house to, for a dinner? Or, like, I know that there are families right in, in this church that are awesome. They actually take people out at lunch every Sunday. So instead of going home and being on their phones, they, they, they use that time to, to take people out. Like, like, here's our problem as a church when it comes to how we live our lives. We have these big back porches and these little small porches. Our, our front porch is very small, and when somebody knocks, we're like, who's that? Right? Oh, is that the mailman? No, that's you know, Jehovah's Witness. I don't know. And you're like, oh, you know, and so you got freaked out. Who's at who's my door? How dare they? But, but isn't this true? When you bought the house, you were like, when we're going to have pool parties here, and, like, and this is going to be for God. Oh, and this is great for company, and this is great for... And then all of a sudden, we have this, this home, and we have never have anybody in it. Am I wrong? And then, because our patterns, our lifestyle is not one of community. It's our pace is wrong. Our priorities are wrong. And so, so to be a church that eats together and break bread together, what that does for the community of believers is that, that pattern is, is to become one in, in like-mindedness. And also, your family gets to interact with other families and, and learn, and it's just amazing. It's a gift. And so this is what they did. They, they discipled each other by getting together, by talking, by, by breaking bread together. You know, one of the things that we're going to be doing here um, in the next few weeks is, is we're going to try to, as a church, actually next year, just like Stephanie was saying, we're trying to get events on the calendar that actually brings us together as a church. Because we're busy. And like, and like she said, some of you have never met anybody in first service. How many of you have ever had a conversation, like, outside of this church? And, they're like, and you're like, you go to Calvary? And they're like, yeah, I've been going for, like, 10 years. You're like, oh, my goodness. I didn't know you went. Because you never see them. You, you, never, you never cross paths. Because often we, we, we kind of come and then we leave. And so this whole idea of CF United, all it is is just to say, hey, come, stay, talk, trade phone numbers, hang out, be a community, get to know each other. And so we're doing this event um, called CF United next week. It's at 10 o'clock. It's a service. 11 to 1 is, is the event. It's out front in the front parking lot. It is crazy the, what they did. <laughs> I mean, we have petting zoos and, and blow-up toys and food trucks, and it's too extreme. But we're going to do it. <laughs> it's crazy, but this is how we do things. It's just, like, unbelievable. But we do that because we're like, we don't want you to leave. How can we get a family not to leave here and go right to their cars? This is the conversation we're having. Because we want you to stay. We want you to talk to each other. That's the goal. And so the idea of community is simply intentionally saying, how, how do we make time for each other? So I'm going to go after some sacred cows here because I know how we spend our time. Because I struggle to spend my time the same way. Here's a sacred cow. And I'm going to premise this. I grew up playing sports, church. I grew up traveling around the country, swimming and wrestling. I played football and baseball. I played every sport you, you know to miss. And, and it was my God. It was my God. It consumed my life. It dominated my time. And so that, that, that's my background here. But let me say something about sports to us. Listen to me. Because I love Jesus more than sports. Sports makes a horrible God. It's a horrible God. And I've discipled thousands of kids and not one pro. And so the conversation becomes, how do we spend our time? And listen, I'm not saying you don't play sports or that your kids shouldn't play sports. But if God and his kingdom is not a part of that, because your kids' team or your favorite pro team, them winning or not, does not matter. But the people that you interact with on a daily basis because of that team do. And so remember this, you're discipling your children. So when you cheer louder for a sports touchdown than you do for a soul who comes to know the Lord, your children see that. And when you say, we can't make it to this kingdom thing because we got to go do this sports thing, your kids see that. And when I look back on the hundreds of hours I spent 
in sports. You know what I am so deeply grateful for? Was my, my parents had Jesus in it. Because you know what gives me hope today? You know what gives me joy today? You know what makes me a good father today, a good husband today? Is my relationship with Jesus, not how many touchdowns I scored. So let's not get distracted by the things that do not matter. And ask the question, if I need to go to this sporting event, is God in this time? Can we redeem it? Can we make it about more than just this? If not, we need to stop it. Because the church is not meant to do the things of this world. It's meant to step into the world and bring hope and life to it. When you have an Eagles game party and you fill your basement with fans, wh why are you doing that? Is it for the Lord? How can it become for the Lord? Listen, I have these battles. I used to be, when I first got married, I was a Penn, I'm a Penn State football fan. I used to be so far into the meaninglessness of sports that I would say to my daughter, say, leave me alone as I watch this. And I was wrong. And I began to say, listen, I love sports, but how do I redeem this? How do I make this more than just a pattern of my life that's meaningless? And I started saying, you know what? Anytime I watch a game, I'm going to invite somebody over to my house. And we're going to talk about the Lord before, and we're going to talk about it after. Maybe not enduring. <laughs> I, still want to, I still want to watch. But I'm going to make it intentional. You hear what I'm saying? So, so I'm not saying, oh, is, is pastor just saying you've got to be at church 24 hours a day? No. Absolutely not. But your pattern of this world should not be the same as unbelievers. And the why should not be the same. And I see so often our church value things that are not eternal with their time over things that are. And we got to stop. Because we will never experience the true fellowship with one another if we don't stop being busy for the wrong reasons. Here's another thing that, that happens when we talk about this. Is we start asking this question, okay, as a family... Because I have to ask this question every day of my life. As a family, are we doing the things that God's calling us to do as a family? And listen, I, I know a lot of you may say this, because I know how the enemy works. Because when you talk truth, it, it, it's convicting. And sometimes people get angry at it. And they justify it. I get it. So you may be saying, hey, you're a pastor. And you get paid to be part of a church. I get it. But, but I said this in first service. I promise you something. I may not always be in ministry. Maybe I'll say something that <laughs> won't let me. I don't know. But, but my family will always serve the Lord. We will always be about the kingdom of God. And yours should be too. This is not something I'm speaking at you. I'm speaking with you here. This is so important that we examine our world and we start to ask this question, okay, how are we spending our time? And, and here's what Francis Chan said. I, I heard this a couple years ago. And, and to this day, I have this happen to me all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm watching my phone or I'm, I'm doing something that doesn't matter. How many of you are, are with me here? You're spending your time on things that doesn't matter, and all of a sudden you're like, my children are over there. Anybody? So, so, so he, here's what happens. He has this quote. He says this, and I, I say this all the time to our kids, and, and I believe this to be true. I believe it to be true, but I want to live this out. Here's what he says. He says, anything you do that's not for the Lord is a waste of time. Let me say that again. Anything you do that is not for the Lord and his kingdom, guys, listen to me, is a waste of time. And I believe that be the truth. We all are going to stand before the Lord, and he's going to say, what did you do with the gifts I've given you? And right now, I want you to ask your question. When he asked that question, what are you doing right now that, that has, no, has no weight on that question? There, there are things in our lives where we're like, i got to put down this. Because this matters. i got to stop spending my time here because this matters. And here's the lie that the enemy has us believing, which consumes most of our time. The enemy has us believe this lie. If you want rest and peace in your life, pursue comfort and entertainment. So we get home from work and we think, ah, oh, we can't do that. I just need to sit and watch TV. And the enemy says, yeah, you just need rest from your rest. And then we, we ask this question, why, why as a church, why as a society are we struggling to find purpose and meaning? Why are we riding with depression and anxiety? It's because we're meant to serve each other. 
not to sit and be comfortable all the time. This is what happened in the early church. They sold their comfort to be in relationship, to be on purpose, to be on mission. This is what we hear in this thing, is this, this idea of, okay, we all may be at capacity, but there are dead branches in our lives that we've got to cut off. Here's another thing they did, and I think this is a byproduct of true fellowship. I really do. A byproduct of true fellowship is prayer. So they prayed together. Why? Because they knew each other. They, they, they knew each other more than just a hello. So they knew when, when somebody was sick or when somebody lost a loved one or when they were going through a, a tough time at work. And so they knew each other to the point where they could pray for each other and bring praises and hope and celebrate with one another. I mean, that's the amazing thing about small groups. Some of you, you can't do the home small group, and that's okay. But the amazing thing about having a gospel-centered community in your life is that you can then begin to open up about who you actually are, what your struggles are. Like, I'm so blessed to have a small group that meets in my, my house on Tuesday nights that, listen, if my wife and I ever have a hard time and we're struggling in marriage, I'm blessed to have a group of people where I can say, hey, help us. We need your prayers. I have that. It's such a gift. I have a community of believers who will come alongside of us and, and be, be the church in our lives. I love that. But listen, the truth is, is some of us, many of us don't have that. And that's the enemy winning. Because we're settling for relationships and community that aren't godly. And God says, no, no, no. Fellowship with one another is key to this thing I call church. You know, you go around the world and most of the churches, this idea of like a petting zoo <laughs> on Sunday morning. <laughs> it's like, what? You know, they, they get together and pray. They get together and pray for each other because church is coming alongside of each other. It's not, it's not to consume, but, but reality is, is, is we have to use some of this to, to bring people into community because this is how we respond. It's a byproduct of how we spend our time. But here's, here's how I want to kind of shift um, towards the end of this teaching. I want to I talk about the fact that there is all these things I just went through, like teaching the word and fellowship and eating together and praying. These things are great, but what made the church effective, what made the church add to their numbers daily was actually not the things they did. It was the attitude that, in which they did it. Because we see this in Scripture, that their hearts were joyful. They were delighted to serve. They were delighted to sacrifice their time and their resources and their finances for the things of the Lord. They were delighted to do that. They sought to do that. Like they woke up every day saying, how can we do more? How can we meet needs? Rather than waking up saying, how can my needs be met? They woke up saying, how can I bless somebody else? So they would sell their car to give to somebody else. Even though they didn't drive. <laughs> sell their horse. I don't know. But they, they, but they pursued blessings over other people. They were other-centered. They were selfless. And this is the culture that they said. And, and really, Jesus warns us about it, doesn't he? He says in Matthew chapter 6, he says that if you pray and you fast and you do these things, but it's for yourself, like if your heart's not right, well then, well then your reward's not. There's nothing there. And so it's not only the idea of, okay, I need to serve and I need to, to do more. It's not, it's not even about that. It's, it's, it's what motivates you to do it. Are you doing it because you want to do it? Are you doing it because somebody like me guilt you into it? Because there's a difference. To be delighted to take time away from um, golfing to go to the men's retreat. I don't know. It's a lot of things. To, to open up your family to having people over to give up your night of watching Netflix. I mean, I don't know what that looks like, but this is what the Bible is challenging us here, is that we are to kind of act like newlyweds towards each other, where we want to be around each other. We, we want to be in fellowship. We want to get to know each other. This is what marks a true fellowship, true community. They weren't just together as an early church. They were unified. They weren't just they didn't have affection towards one another. They, they had love towards one another. They loved each other. Like, like here, here's the thing. Right now, as I'm talking, because I, I grew up in church, I know how this works. Right now, a lot of you are just trying to figure me out. You are. Anytime you have somebody come up here and teach, you try to figure them out. You try to hit, figure out their background, what's their agenda. What, because, because that's how our, our world works. So when somebody like me says, I love you, that means a lot of things. It does. But, but, but here, here's the truth, is that when I say I love you, here, here's what I mean, is my prayer for you is that you grow in your love and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That you know more of him. Because you don't need my love, you need his. 
So I want to I wanna be somebody that points you to him. So when I'm up here, I want to say something that makes you leave here thinking, my family needs to do more to be in community because we need to do more for the Lord. That's the goal. Not, hey, great teaching. It's no, 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 we have a great God who's worthy of our time, our energy, our resources. And so here's what I did to kind of to leave us here. I, w- I wanted to do something um, as like a prayer, to join together as a community for a prayer. Because I want my life, and this is kind of a selfish thing of me, I want my life to be glorifying to God. I want to do a lot for the kingdom of God. I do. And so God has me in this community with my brothers and sisters, and I want to do something good for the Lord. Amen? Like, how many of you want your life to matter for the kingdom of God? I do. And so my prayer is, how do we as a church build the kingdom of God? And, and the first step is we have to obey. We have to be the church that God calls us to be in order for him to be able to use it. And so this is why I'm saying these things, because these are our idols in our lives. This is how we spend our time. And we need to start to transform those things, start to redeem those things or change them. And so here's what I wrote as just my prayer. The band can come up, but, but my prayer here is that the church honestly moves from lazy to intentional. Like, like I'll, I'll make this real for you because this broke me. I, I started crying when God, when God gave this thought to me because I was reading an article and it was about human sex trafficking. How many of you, brothers and sisters in Christ, how many of you weep when you hear that stuff? That there are children right now that are being kidnapped, taken around the world as human slaves to have sexual acts being done. How many of you hear that and think, I got to do something? Because I do. And and here's the point of why I'm so passionate this morning. It's because as this is happening, look at me, as this is happening, the church is playing video games. church is binge watching Netflix. And we're the hope of the world. So, so something's got to change. And it's us. It's our time. It's, it's, we need to go to bed tired because we're doing the work of the Lord. Not trying to be comfortable. The, the, the church was made by pa- martyrs. We, we, we got to change. We got to wake up. And it doesn't come from self-help sermons. It comes from saying, listen, I feel convicted right now. I don't spend my time for the Lord. Listen, God has gifted some of you right now to end that. He's given you the resources to end it, the time to end it, the gifts to end it. And we're playing golf. And there's nothing wrong with golf. It's the time that we have needs to be kingdom. Are you hearing me? So what are we doing? Maybe we bring people along those things that we love, but for the glory of God, not for ourselves. Because this is happening. We got children right now that have no discipleship in their lives. Students that have no discipleship in their lives because the people who are called to disciple them are going home. Come on. And so here's my prayer for the church. Here's my prayer for us. And so I'm just going to list them and then Stephen's going to lead us as we take offering. I pray that we are a church that doesn't just meet needs in and outside of this church, but we own them. We don't say, yeah, I can help once a month. It's, no, no, I'll take that on. I pray that we are a church where when people walk in, the love that we have for each other blows them away. I pray that we are a church that the kids ministry has so many volunteers that they have to call people and say, we don't need you. And, And even then, people are like, but how can I serve? How can I help? Overflowing with volunteers that our students are being discipled by many people in our church, many different ages, many different backgrounds, all pointing our students to Jesus, all being discipled by our people. I pray that we are a church where when a new mother has a baby, is surrounded by godly, wise women who are meeting her needs and speaking hope to her in her tough times and, and is giving her wisdom. I pray that that's happening. I pray that every young man here that, that is battling, that is surrounded by godly men, that are giving him wise counsel and saying, listen, it's okay. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I pray that we are a church where hope and wisdom, when it comes to addiction and marriage, is just everywhere. That a a family and and a marriage that's struggling is surrounded by godly men and women speaking life and hope into that marriage and into that addiction. I pray that we are a church that when we love each other so deeply, it is felt when people pull into the parking lot and it's felt all throughout the community during the week. 
I pray that we are a church that we have to plant new small groups and new churches. And we have to have church every night of the week because we can't hold what God is doing. I pray that we are a church where when we do United events, when we do events, we have more servants than we do attenders. How amazing would that be? I pray we're a church that when we have prayer gatherings, we have to do it in a tent in the parking lot because there's not enough room to hold the people. I pray that we are a church that doesn't just give, but we sacrificially give. That if there's a debt in the church, we eliminate it. When a family says there's a need, we eliminate that need. I pray we're a church, listen, that 50,000 people come next week, we're ready. We're ready. And we just simply look at each other and say, let's, let's be the church. God's called us to be. And we close this in prayer. Father, we love you. And Lord, simply put, help us to be the church that you want us to be. Lord, change the patterns in our lives right now that are not of your kingdom, that are not of your will and your purpose, Lord. Help us to do all things, all things for your glory. Lord, I pray right now for the gifts that you've given the brothers and sisters in this place that they are not using for you, Lord, to fight back the darkness, that they change that this message resonates with them, that the Spirit of God, that you convict them until the patterns of their lives change so that they're kingdom patterns. We want to pray for blessing over our offering, blessing over our events next week, our conferences. And Lord, I also want to lift up and praise those right now that are doing this, that are working full-time jobs, but are, but are being in the church and, and, and being obedient to what you've given them. I think of Steve and the team behind me and all the gifts that they bring and they sacrifice their time on Thursdays and on Sunday mornings so that they would glorify you with the gifts that you've given them. Thank you for them. Thank you for the servants all over this building right now. So I pray that we would be a church that is faithful to do the things that we're called to do and to be the community that we're called to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.